Greetings, everybody. Uh, my name is Kainde Ajayi, and I am delighted to be with you today to talk about centralized school assignment information. Um, in today's lecture as part of this course on uh, education. I welcome you to ask questions in the chat as we go along and I'll stop every once in a while to answer them. Uh, but we'll dive right in and get started. So I'm gonna be talking today about centralized school choice and really I'll start by giving you an example to make it clear in everybody's minds what I'm talking about when we talk about centralized school assignment and information. Every year in Ghana, half a million children like these we see in front of you uh, have an opportunity to apply to any school, secondary school in the country. And so across, across the country and across different parts of, of throughout the world, uh, children, students and their families are faced with this uh, decision of where to apply to schools. And centralized school assignment systems provide a unique opportunity where anyone in this room that you see in front of you um, could potentially go to the best schools in the country. Uh, at the same time, each of the students comes into this process with a very different, um, potentially different set of information. Some of these students might have parents and siblings who have gone to secondary school before and have a lot of information about what the options are, what the trade-offs are, what the potential benefits are of going to a certain type of school versus another. Other students might be the first one in their family to have completed junior high school, um, might not have any information about which schools to apply to, might only know the local school that they walk by um, and would be Face in a similar situation where they are, have this opportunity but don't have the resources and potentially don't have the information to make the choices uh, that could potentially change their futures. And so what I'm gonna be talking with you about today is this question of how information, what role information plays in this school choice process. And beyond that, what tools we have available as researchers, policymakers to understand the role of, of information in this process. Uh, I'll um, be going through um, this question of looking at how information affects two things. One is the choices that students make, and the second is looking at their outcomes. Uh, so where do they end up going, um, and how does that um, affect potentially their long-run educational outcomes and the process of economic development in the long run? So beyond this First central question of what type of information or how important is information, we have four additional questions that I'll be talking about and, and discussing today. One is beyond information as a grand concept, what type of information to provide? Um, it could potentially be information on school attributes. So in the case of Ghana that I mentioned earlier, these 500,000 students have an opportunity to apply to 800 schools in the country. Their admission is based on um, their test scores on an exam. And so they might potentially be interested in knowing what the school attributes are, what characteristics of the schools are, as well as knowing what's their probability of gaining admission. A second question is how to provide this information. Uh, in low technology situations, it might be a printed booklet. We could also think about leveraging television, video, radio, um, different um, online platforms, text messaging, uh, thinking about social networks as ways to provide information. And these are all questions that may have impacts on how important, how useful information is. A third question is who to provide information to. I talked about students in this case, um, but they are coming from households. And an important question is to understand, potentially to understand who are the key decision makers. Is it the students themselves who are making their choices? Or is it their parents, other people, teachers, uh, other family members uh, who might be the key decision makers? And a third question is when to provide this information. Is it most useful early on when people have an opportunity to digest it? Or is it more valuable um, closer to the deadline for making these choices when people might be more salient, have more salience in terms of making these decisions? Um, so I talked about the case of Ghana, but these centralized school assignment systems are used in over 60 countries across the world, not just for admission to secondary school, but admission to primary school, universities, kindergartens. Uh, so this is a... Uh, potentially powerful um, 
mechanism for uh, addressing several issues we would be thinking of, we might be interested in from a perspective of economic development. One is addressing inequality, providing opportunities for students from disadvantaged backgrounds to go into high performing schools to access um, uh, a higher value of education. Uh, and then also thinking about issues of um, efficiency and what is the most effective way to assign kids to students to schools to maximize the um, value of all the resources in the school choice system. Um, so as we talk about this, I'll provide examples from different contexts, um, but keep in mind that this is a potentially relevant question for a much broader set of, situa of, 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 um, of contexts and, and situations. So I'll talk through as I go um, today about five uh, key features of empirical analysis, which allow us to answer that question, which is fundamentally, how does information affect choices and outcomes of students in these centralized school choice systems? And the five components that I'll uh, focus on are one, administrative data, which is really the foundation uh, and unique feature of centralized school choice systems, is the wealth of information that they collect um, simply in the process of uh, implementing these school choice um, assignments that happen uh, typically every year. And then I'll talk about this complement, the basically building blocks that we can add on to this foundation of administrative data to enhance our understanding of school choice systems uh, and the role of information. So the second thing I'll talk about is survey data and how that uh, complements administrative data. The third thing is the role of exogenous variation, which allows us to identify, to separate what is the role of information from the role of other things that might be explaining choices in different contexts. The fourth thing is structural estimation, which is a um, empirical approach, which allows us to go beyond identifying the impacts of a certain uh, policy change or information intervention to think outside of that about the potential impacts of counterfactual, so additional alternative um, policy changes or programs or feature changes in the system that might impact um, students' well-being. And the last thing is the role of qualitative data. Um, so as economists, we typically don't use a lot of administrative data. You don't use a lot of qualitative data in our work, um, but in the case of school choice in particular, uh, I'll talk about what uh, potential value of qualitative data could be in this context. Um, so with this roadmap, I'll stop for a moment to ask if there are any questions as we, um, uh, before we dive into going to these five components and understanding how each of these feeds into our understanding of uh, the role of information in centralized school choice systems and what this means for um, a broader uh, understanding of the role of education in economic development. So I'll pause there for any questions. We don't currently have any questions, but that's a good reminder. If anyone does want to ask one, they can just put it in the Q&A box. Okay, I'll keep going then. And yes, feel free to ask questions as we go along. So as I said earlier, administrative data is really the foundation uh, and one of the most exciting unique features of um, centralized school assignment systems. And why is this? So in education, um, administrative data is useful. Uh, and we usually typically have access to test score data. That's the most common form of administrative data that uh, we have access to. Um, but in these centralized school choice systems, this process through which um, millions sometimes or hundreds of thousands of students are assigned to schools um, through a common uh, system, one of the advantages is that information is automatically collected through the school choice process. Uh, and what these typically include is a student's uh, list of their preferred choices. So students are typically um, allowed to or, or instructed to submit a rank list of choices. This could be an unlimited number of choices or it could be uh, limited to a certain number of choices. Uh, and, and then we also have some kind of um, priority ranking. So it's often test scores, but it could be in some cases a lottery or some other scheme for uh, or a mechanism for ranking students' priorities. And so uh, one extremely useful aspect of these centralized school choice systems is that they generate uh, a rich amount of information in their process of implementation. So we already have, um, in the case of Ghana, for example, every year, um, the government has information from 500,000 students on 
what their preferences are for where they would like to go to school, what their test scores are, uh, and then also where they end up being assigned based on the mechanism. And this covers the universe of students in schools. So often if we're collecting our own data, we only have information on as much as big a sample as we're able to afford. Um, but in this context, every single student in the Ghana case completing junior high school um, is included in this administrative data set. Um, so it provides a really valuable opportunity to get a, a holistic picture of um, where students are coming from, how students from different backgrounds are making choices and where they're ending up going. Uh, on the downside though, limitations are that based on administrative data alone, we typically don't observe detailed background characteristics. Um, often we would know uh, a student's um, name, their age, where they're coming from, but not rich information on their parents' educational background, for example, or information on um, other things about their peer group and, and things that might signal the information they have. And then another limitation when we're thinking about information in particular is that we often don't observe beliefs and preferences. So we would ideally want to know what do students perceive to be um, their chances of gaining admission to different schools? What do they perceive to be the quality of different schools? Um, and what are their preferences? Where would they like to go if they could make a choice without any limitations? Uh, so while administrative data has several advantages, particularly in the context of these centralized school choice systems, there are certain limitations. And so I'll talk now about a particular um, paper, one context where we look at, uh, where I look at the uh, question of what are the barriers to educational mobility in the context of a school choice um, assignment mechanism in Ghana. Uh, and so the key approach is to model the school choice problem using administrative data to, and then empirically analyze heterogeneity in student demand. So under, trying to understand what are the key features that determine where students apply to schools um, and the differences between students from different backgrounds. So I'll give a bit of background information on um, Ghana's education system to uh, share what the context is before talking about the data and the analysis in this, in this context. Uh, and again, as I said earlier, this is one example I'll focus on here, but this, these centralized, similar centralized school choice systems are used across the world um, for different levels of transition into schooling. Uh, so in Ghana's education system, there are three levels of schooling. First, uh, students complete six years of primary school, and then three years of junior high school and three years of secondary school. And at the end of junior high school, so at the end of the first nine years, they uh, transition into secondary school based on this computerized school selection and placement system, which is one example of these centralized school choice systems. Uh, and the way it worked um, the, during the period I'm studying has changed now somewhat, but um, was that students around this time submitted a list of up to six secondary schools. Then they take a centralized exam, the basic education certification exam, and they get assigned to schools based on their uh, exam score and the rank list of choices that they submit. Uh, and the way it works is basically effectively the highest achieving student gets assigned to their first choice school. Um, and then the second student gets assigned to the next school and so on down the list. Uh, and so while students are applying to schools, um, there are these complications in their application decision. Although they have the opportunity in principle to apply to any schools in the country and to potentially go to any school in the country, they're faced with several complications. One is that they have to apply before they take their exam during this period of study. And, and this is true for a lot of other um, contexts. So they don't know their admission priority, what their admission chances are when they're applying. They can only apply to six schools and um, there's no publicly provided information uh, on admission standards. So what is the cutoff for admission to different schools? Um, there's no information uh, or some students have limited information on what the academic performance of different schools are uh, and other things, aspects of the schools that might contribute to um, informing their decisions. Uh, and so what this means is, is that um, ideally students would want to know what are all the options? What are my chances of getting into all of these options? And um, if they don't have that information, they could ideally just list as many schools that they want and apply to all the schools out of the 2000, over 2000 options they have of a school and a program and, and get assigned. 
And so the way uh, I model this um, problem is uh, that we have in the setup, a set of students with an unknown ability. So when they're applying, they don't know what their test score is going to be. And a set of schools with a known uh, quality threshold, which is basically what is the um, minimum test score required for admission in, in previous years. And then each student assigns some utility to attending each school. And so that's basically the way um, you would imagine this is a, a bundled um, a measure of how much a student would want to go to a school and the associated costs with going to a school. So overall, the net benefit of, of attending a, spe a specific school. Uh, and then each student has a subjective admission probability. So what they perceive to or believe to be their chance of gaining admission to each school. Uh, so the combination of their expected uh, admission chance and the utility, so how much they think they would like being in a given school, um, which is a function of uh, the distance to the school, the quality of the school, perhaps other people who are there, um, and what they think is their chance there, the likelihood that they enjoy being in a school. So given um, their utility and assigned pro admission probability, students have expected value of applying. Uh, and, and based on these, students choose an application portfolio. Uh, so in cases where they have a list of a limited list of six schools, that means that students submit a rank list of their preferred six choices, their first, most preferred, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. Um, if there is no um, cost for applying or no limit, then students would submit an unlimited list of uh, a long list of schools and they would just rank all the schools for which they have um, a positive expected utility from attending in their order of preferences. Uh, and I'll continue with this one last slide before we I stop for questions. Um, but in this context, then students solve this problem of trying to maximize um, the expected utility of their uh, admission portfolio, which is a function of their expected utility from attending their first choice school, and then the conditional utility from attending their second school, um, conditional on not getting into their first choice school, um, and so on down the list. And so students are basically trying to maximize um, their overall well-being from submitting a given uh, portfolio of schools. Uh, in the case of Ghana at this time, students have um, over 2,600 alternatives because they can apply to a school and then a program track within a school, like general arts, general science, uh, agriculture, technology, and so on. Um, and they can only submit six choices. Uh, and so identifying the optimal portfolio would um, computationally acquire if they had all the information, um, uh, computing uh, the overall combinations, um, expected utility from all the different potential combinations of these um, different schools, um, which is um, a huge number of, of portfolios to choose before, which is basically highlighting the fact this is a very complex problem. Uh, and we could generalize this by saying, in this case, I've, in this case, I've, um, highlighted uh, a case with uh, merit-based admission. So your admission cutoff is based on your test score, but it could be based on a lottery, it could be based on distance to school, um, different factors, but the same principles are the same. The students are making these decisions based on their expected utility and um, their, uh, their, their perceived utility assigned to attending a different school and their expected admission uh, chances. Um, I'll stop there again if there are any questions. Uh, we don't currently have any questions on, on this section. Uh, okay. So unless anyone puts one in immediately, we can move on. Okay. Oh, we have one. Okay. Uh, two questions. Um, the first is clarification question. Is this centralized assignment just for public schools or also including private schools? Do you see in the data students applying to schools outside their municipalities slash sub regions? And the second question is, doesn't too much choice imply a rabbit in the headlights syndrome? Yes, thank you for those questions. So the first one, um, does this apply to public and private schools? So yes, and this is in the case of, of Ghana, there, there are public and private schools both included. Um, and the majority of schools are public schools, but students can also um, apply to private schools. And these are all the key um, feature here is these are all schools that follow the national curriculum. Uh, so in which schools take the um, secondary school certification exam at the end 
of, um, of secondary school. So there are some private schools, uh, elite uh, international private schools that follow other curricula that are not part of this. But for the student schools that are following the national curriculum, they are also included in the centralized assignment process. There are, um, and this is the case in Ghana. I'll talk about some other uh, contexts that have similar choice systems. For example, in Mexico, the system focuses on public schools only, and there's a separate system for private schools. Uh, so it varies in different contexts, but in here it does, it is focused on both public and private schools. Um, and then the second question about rabbit in the headlights, absolutely. So um, as you can see, this is a huge number of potential um, uh, alternatives that students can choose between. And Ghana is a case where it is a truly national system. There are no restrictions on um, requiring students to apply to schools within their local um, district or um, even in the region. Uh, and so this varies across different contexts, but in this case, uh, this is absolutely uh, a case where there is a ton of choice and YLAP provides a lot of flexibility and opportunities, like I said, for students from any school in the country to apply to um, any, any junior high school to apply to any senior high school. And as is, at the same time, as you would imagine, uh, is uh, a complicated system. And so one of the questions that comes up is the search costs involved and is, is search cost um, one of the factors that limits? We can't imagine that anyone would have the time or ability to get information on all these choices. Um, so information could be informative in telling people what types of schools might be particularly relevant for them. It looks like we have a few more questions that came in. Yeah, I'll take a couple more for now. Um, how do you capture issues of parents paying bribes to determine school placement in this model? And the second question, would students outside options matter? If I had a good alternative to secondary school, I'd just pick my top choices. Yes, I think both those questions are related because um, outside options is basically opting out of um, complying with your admission assignment is one way to think about it is to unify those two things. So basically if certain students have a higher chance of um, opting out, so once you uh, submit your choices, you receive one admission assignment. Uh, if different students have different um, options uh, or likelihoods of, of being able to uh, not comply and still find somewhere else to go, either by bribing their way into a different school or by going into um, uh, one of these elite private schools um, or going to, yeah, finding somewhere else to go to school, uh, then would that affect their choices? Um, and so the key insight here is one that those outside options are not guaranteed and they're more often more costly. So in the, in the centralized system, um, the only cost you need to pay is to well, and now that secondary school is free, but in the centralized system, if you um, submit choices, it's costless to uh, apply. There's no admission cost to apply to different schools. Uh, and so for everybody, the question of maximizing your chances within the assignment system is relevant. Um, and if you are interested in the outside option, there's always a risk associated with it. So you could, the outside option will um, likely influence what, um, what people, how it could potentially influence how aggressive people are in their choices. But for even people with the outside option, this is a costless way of applying to schools. And so there is um, every child, every student applying through this has an incentive um, to maximize expected utility within the system uh, because of the fact that it's a costless uh, a choice and, and the outside option is often risky. There is no, some school choice systems have a guaranteed homeschool that you get assigned to regardless of whether or not you, if you choose not to apply through the centralized system, um, then you can uh, be guaranteed a default school. But in cases, in a lot of cases like the Ghana case where you're required to make active choice, um, the outside option is, is not guaranteed or is not costless. Okay, I'll pause for if there are any additional questions beyond that. Uh, if we have time, there's two more. Sure. I think we can... uh, Kumar asks, what is N here? I think referring to the equation. And yeah. another question, how about the utility of parents? Great question. So N is the number of choices that you can submit. So here, um, so you're applying to a portfolio um, of, of A schools. 
And so that's n is the, the number of, of choices in your portfolio. And that depends on the cho choice mechanism. So in some cases, students are allowed to list an unlimited number of choices. And that way, in that case, the cost of applying to school is zero. And there's no um, limit on the uh, small n it is, is infinity. Um, but in cases like the Ghana case, where you're constrained to apply to six schools or it's changed to five or four over different years, um, then the cost is zero if you apply to less than six schools, um, but becomes infinity if you apply to more. And so um, that's basically uh, uh, the size of your application portfolio and the number of big, large n is the number of schools in your choice in your that you apply that you list, and small n is um, the uh, constraint if there is a constraint. Okay, was that was there a second question that I missed? Oh, the parents' utility versus children, right. Okay, um, and this is one I'll talk about in one of the examples of the papers that I'll, I'll present. Um, and that's absolutely, so here I'm modeling this as a set of students assigning utility for each student to a different school, but you could imagine that um, parents, depending on the age of the student and the dynamics within the household, uh, it could be the parent who's actively making the decision and who's actively involved in, in making the decision if they're informed and if they're interested. Um, but if it's a case where it's a parent who hasn't gone to secondary school or um, uh, doesn't have enough information or is less in involved in the, the education of the child, uh, then it might be the child who's actively the signature choice. So it really comes down to, um, it varies by context. And this is one of the things that I'll highlight in a paper and it, it, that's important to look at um, but, and it, uh, potentially important to understand is um, who is the key decision making, maker what preferences do they have? Are they the same as the preferences as of the student themselves? And what type of information do they have? Uh, if you have a case where there are two um, decision makers with different preferences and different beliefs, then providing information to different, these different agents would likely have different impacts on the choices. Um, and so that's a very important question to consider and it's gonna vary based on the context and uh, individual uh, situations. Okay, so what administrative data do we have in this context? So we have information for students from 2005 to 2009 um, in this particular paper. And at that point, there are about 350,000 students each year. Uh, and through the centralized system, uh, students have to list their birth date, their sex, and the junior high school they attended. Um, and then they submit their rank list of choices. We also observe their standardized test score, which is used for their assignment and uh, observe which school they get assigned to. Um, and a key thing here, getting back to the point about paying bribes and outside option, is from administrative data, all we know is where students get assigned. Um, typically don't observe where they actually go um, because that's often not captured in the centralized school assignment system. Um, that could be gained by combining this information with other data sources. So in other studies, you can link um, administrative data on its selection process with administrative data on um, the secondary school completion, or if schools have a register that's centralized, um, you could link it to other data sets. Uh, but typically all we see is what students choose, where they get assigned, um, and not where they actually go. And then on the school side, um, this is often in the administrative data information on uh, in, in Ghana, at this point, there were 9,000 junior high schools, 650 senior high schools, and uh, multiple programs within program track within each senior high school. And so for each of those, we observe the basic characteristics, the location of the school, um, how long it's been open for, um, whether it's single sex or um, co-ed, public or private, and you can imagine other uh, characteristics of um, the number of students assigned and things like that. Uh, and we can combine this with historical data on from previous years to, to compute what was historically the minimum test score students assigned, the average test score students assigned. And then um, linking it with other data sources, we can also observe what is the academic performance of the school, how well do students perform on the um, secondary school completion exam. Um, so based on these observed choices, um, in this paper we could see uh, if we group schools into junior high schools into three groups, um, schools that perform above the median in the public junior high schools on the um, 
basic education certification exam, which is the ninth grade exam. Um, schools that perform, sorry, yeah, above the medium, below the medium, and then private junior high schools. Uh, and what we observe is if we compare these students uh, and uh, they're um, sorting students based on their individual um, exam scores, so their ninth grade exam scores, and look at the selectivity of schools that they apply to, we see is that students from low performing public junior high schools in the solid black dots um, apply to schools that are less selective than equally qualified students from high performing public junior high schools and private junior high schools. Um, so basically at every, any given point in time, if we look at the zero, um, uh, which is the, um, the mean BEC test score, we see that uh, students with the same academic achievement, but from different backgrounds are applying to different schools. Um, and so the question here is, why are they doing this? And what is, um, and we could potentially ask, we would want to know what is the role of information? Now, is this because they have different information about um, what schools are available, or is it because their preferences and their perceived utility of attending different schools? It could be that they know all the schools that are available uh, and they know um, their chances of getting into all the schools, but they're choosing not to apply to um, more selective schools because of um, either the costs of going or the perception that they're not going to like being there or they're not going to have a high chance of succeeding um, or the distance of traveling or different things like that. Based on administrative data alone, it's very difficult to separate out the um, potential of preferences versus beliefs. Um, so there, in this paper, I show there are ways in which we can um, focus on, say, what to what extent can we explain this based on preferences alone? Uh, but we can't rule out beliefs because we don't observe that. We don't know whether students, um, what they believe uh, their chances are of admission at different schools. We don't know if they have accurate information on what the cutoffs are. Um, and uh, information about the different school characteristics. And so while administrative data can be extremely helpful in painting a, uh, an overall snapshot of what's happening in a given assignment system, um, the choices that students are making, uh, where they're getting assigned, um, it has limitations in that we can not observe uh, what people's beliefs are um, and how that is separate from their preferences. Uh, and we also um, have limited background information on, on individual students based on this assignment data. I'm gonna stop here because I think we have some more questions. Uh, yeah, I'll take two for now. Um, are we assuming the preferences of the students and the parents are the same when making choices? And the second question, do you also see the impact of teacher performance and or incentives or did you add this to school performance? Uh, great question. So the first one where um, in this simplified model, yes, we're assuming that um, the student is a decision maker and they're uh, kind of modeling it as a unified, a single decision maker. So whether it's the students or parents, there's one person who makes the decision and that's their utility. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about a, another paper where we test this by basically providing information in some context to students only and in other contexts, providing information to students and parents. And this allows us to unbundle whether um, they, uh, they have similar information and whether um, targeting parents directly leads to different impacts from targeting students alone. Um, so if parents and students were jointly making decisions, um, then giving information to students should give us the same impacts as um, giving information to parents directly. But if on average, um, they are not always aligned, then giving information to parents directly should give different impacts from giving information to students directly. And that's what we find on some of these outcomes, some dimensions of students' choices and um, the impacts on, on whether student, where students end up going to school. And you can think about this in practice of going back to the question um, earlier that there is gonna be variation in, in terms of, you know, some parents are very aware of what choices students uh, that children are making. They have these discussions with children. And in other contexts, um, parents are um, you know, less involved either because they don't have as much information uh, or inclination to, to, um, uh, to participate. And this could be tied to uh, socioeconomic background and could be one of the mechanisms through which we see limitations in educational mobility. So the, the, the limited or, or 
decreased likelihood of um, students from disadvantaged backgrounds to apply to more selective schools could be because their parents might be less involved because they have um, less guidance and fewer people um, assisting them in the educational in the school selection process. So it's a very important dimension to look at and um, yeah, a, a great question to, to, to highlight. Um, the second question, uh, please remind me, I forgot what the second one was. Uh, the second question was about teacher performance and whether that comes under school performance. Yes, so um, in terms of the data, so in terms of the model, when we think about the utility of student assigns to a school, it could be part of that is, um, you know, what is their expected likelihood of completing school and enjoying their experience there, which could be linked to, um, you know, how well do teachers perform in the schools. Um, and it could also be just linked to their peer environment. Um, how likely do they think that their students are going to um, be positive influences and support their learning? Um, so here uh, in the academic performance, in terms of, and this is a limitation of administrative data, all we observe typically is how well a school performs on the exam. So you know, what share of students pass the secondary school exam? And that is a function um, of multiple inputs. I, I know you've talked about, uh, covered the education production function earlier. So it is a summary um, uh, indicator of um, multiple factors in the education production function. Uh, so in this, we can't separate that out, but that's an opportunity for, um, you know, to complement um, this basic administrative data with additional data. Um, and so that leads, Nicely on to the second point. So while administrative data is, is valuable and provides a useful foundation for um, understanding uh, this potential role of information in this context, it has the limitations in that we can only see typically um, some pretty crude summary measures of different aspects of things happening in the system that we would potentially be interested in. And so survey data provides an opportunity to um, complement that. And in two key ways, one is that we can collect detailed background information. So we could find out things like what is your parents educational background, how involved are parents in the decision making process, are you the main decision maker or um, uh, who are the main people that help you in, in choosing um, schools. Um, and uh, how many, uh, what's the main reason you, you, you stop looking for schools, is there evidence of, of this um, kind of um, rabbit hole thing of, of having too many options. Um, so we can think of uh, you know, a lot of detailed background information we could ask. And then we can also directly ask about beliefs and preferences. Uh, so while in the administrative data, all we see are the choices that students submit. Um, with survey data, we have an opportunity to ask them, uh, for each of the schools that you submitted, what do you think is your chance of getting into that school? How well do you think that school performs? How much would you like going to? So uh, often in these um, school choice systems, st students might not have incentives to truthfully report their top six choices. If you can only apply to six choices uh, and you don't know your test score, you're more likely to, uh, you, your incentive is to um, apply to a diversified set of schools. So not just to list your top six choices, because if you don't get into one of those six choices, you could end up unassigned. And so the actual choices submitted do not represent your preferences. Uh, and survey data, you could ask a student and their parent, uh, what are the top six choices you would choose if you could choose any choices that you wanted to. And that gives us more information about um, their underlying preferences that we don't get from seeing their ranked choices in the system. Um, and as I said earlier, you could also ask about their behavior. Um, where did you get information from when you were applying to schools? Uh, who did you talk to and those types of things. And so survey data provides an opportunity to fill in a lot of gaps in terms of uh, complementing the administrative data and addressing the things we don't see in administrative data. At the same time, it comes with its own limitations. Uh, first of all, it's costly. Uh, so it's not automatic. It's not uh, something that just happens as a function of the implementation of the centralized uh, school assignment. Uh, and um, some Countries, some systems include a basic questionnaire that might ask some simple background information about parents, for example, um, and maybe um, some information about beliefs. But the more information you add, the longer the survey, the more expensive it is and the more uh, difficult it is to uh, capture the full um, the universe of students in this. And so there's trade offs in terms of you get more information, but typically for a smaller subset of the, of the population. 
Uh, and then the second limitation is that self-reports might themselves be biased. So um, we could ask people about um, their beliefs, uh, their choices, even asking people to recall their choices often differs from the actual choices we see in uh, administrative data. Uh, so um, there are some, and depending on the question that we're looking at and the context, uh, self-report might be less reliable measure of some things than uh, directly observing what uh, choices students made or, or, or households made and where they ended up getting assigned. Okay, I think I see more questions before I move on to the next. Uh, one question is, do we have any choices except for information interventions since we are not sure even using surveys that the students are revealing their true preferences? Is there any possible mechanism design change that leads to welfare improvement in these subjective cases? Um, so repeat that, you said, do we have any information? Could you, uh, I I'll, I'll repeat yeah. it. Um, do we have any choices except for information interventions since we are not sure even using these surveys that the students are revealing their true preferences? Is there any possible mechanism design change that leads to welfare improvement in these cases? Um, okay, so I think that if I understood the question correctly, this is basically asking whether uh, if we have information interventions and we're trying to pick, uh, capture the impacts of information interventions during, using survey data, um, that may not be unreliable because survey data might be biased. Uh, are there other ways we can um, address information constraints beyond using information interventions. Uh, so there are mechanism design changes that could address information. Um, one of the things is shifting from, uh, to strategy proof mechanisms. So um, when we think about what types of information might be helpful in navigating or maximizing um, the potential benefits, an individual's potential benefits in a school choice system, one type of information is an understanding of how the mechanism works. Uh, so a lot of school choice systems, like I said earlier, don't provide incentives for you to truthfully report your preferences. If you only have six choices and you don't know your test score, then um, you need to be sophisticated in terms of thinking about what to submit. Um, you, it is not optimal for everybody to just submit their six most preferred choices because there's a risk you would be unassigned. So in terms of mechanism design changes, Systems that, um, mechanisms that are strategy proof where the uh, optimal um, uh, um, strategy is to tell the truth. So just truthfully list your most preferred choices out of all the options. Address this information constraint in terms of understanding how uh, the mechanism works and what the um, optimal strategy is. Uh, so there are potential mechanism design changes that could make information availability or differences in information availability less of a constraint for students by encouraging them all to just truthfully report their choices. Um, as I'll show later though, even in strategy proof mechanisms, there is this question about search costs and the fact that even if people are free to choose um, as many schools as they want, it is still costly to get information on all the choices available and to process what the trade-offs are of, of, of uh, um, going to each one. So even in those cases, there could be uh, benefits of having information interventions, um, but there are some ways in which uh, mechanism design changes, so changes, changes in the number of choices students can submit, the way in which um, their preferences are, are uh, or their assignment is, is done, so what the assignment mechanism is, can address, alleviate some of these information constraints. Um, and yeah, I think that addresses that question. Was there a second question? Uh, I think that's all the questions from this section. Okay. Um, so that leads into, so talking about information inventions, this leads to this, this next part, which is um, building on administrative data that we have as foundation and then survey data, which complements this with additional information, fills in the gaps that we don't see with the administrative data. A third useful component is having exogenous variation. And by this, I mean um, changes in access to information that are independent of a student's potential outcomes. Uh, so if we have, ideally we want two students who are um, similar in terms of what choices they would make and where they would get assigned. And um, 
the ideal uh, thought experiment would be to you know, provide information to one, to randomly provide information to one student and not the other, and then to see how that changes a student's choices and their admission outcomes. Um, and so the key thing with this uh, variation is this allows us to separate the fact that um, in the data we observe, students that have more information um, might have potential outcomes that are different even in the absence of information. Uh, so if we think about the picture earlier, the classroom, there could be students who um, have parents that are more informed. They um, have parents who are more involved in the process. They have more information about all the schools. They might have um, access to uh, a booklet with information about all the schools in the country. And um, whether or not they had that booklet, they probably would have uh, applied to a different set of schools than a student who, whose parent hasn't gone to school, who doesn't have resources available. Um, what we really want to see is for two students who both don't have parents who've gone to secondary school before, uh, both coming from um, an under-resourced um, junior high school with limited information, to see what happens when you give information to one of those students and not the other, and how does that change their choices. Um, so the fact that uh, typically um, information availability is correlated with um, students' preferences, the choices they would make, um, and their future outcomes means that we can't just look at um, comparing people who have a lot of information and people who don't um, and say, what are the differences in outcomes and use that as a way to, under to uh, estimate what the value of information is because of this unobserved correlation between information availability and potential outcomes. Uh, and so a way to address this is to use exogenous variation. So a, a variation in information and um, availability that's independent of students' preferences and the choices that they would make. Uh, and the advantage of, of, of using some sort of exogenous variation is that allows us to then say, what is the role of information um, per se, information as separate from preferences, um, other resources, and other things that might affect students' choices. Um, the limitations are that when we look at a source of exogenous variation, we're typically uh, um, identifying the impact of one type of information change. Um, and so we we can't necessarily say what would happen if we change this type of information in a different context, or if we change it in a different way, if we did it at a different scale. Um, and so um, we have this uh, issue of local average treatment effect, basically where we're estimating effects of a change in information for a certain population at a certain point in time, um, rather than saying it in general. And there are ways to get around this, for example, by doing a similar intervention in multiple contexts to validate whether we get the same uh, uh, types of, of effects in different places. Um, and also by thinking about the ways in which the given context generalizes to other contexts. What is similar about the situation compared to other situations and what's different that might not generalize. Uh, another um, limitation is that we often can see the overall effect of change in information without necessarily understanding the um, mechanism. So if we do see that giving someone a, a booklet or um, inviting them to an information workshop changes their choices. Um, it's often not uh, immediate that we know why it changes the choices without additional work. There are steps we could take, for example, looking at outcomes along the causal chain, different steps along the way to see what changes, to understand what, me what the mechanism is. Um, but if we just look at the outcomes, the final outcomes as a result of change in information, then we can sometimes miss an understanding of what the underlying mechanisms and what the key constraints were. So I'll talk about three examples of um, studies that have used exogenous variation to identify the effect of changes in information. One is the study I talked about earlier where um, I and, and, a, uh, and two co-authors look at the effects of providing information to parents as well as students versus students only um, using a randomized experiment. And then the other two look at user regression discontinuity design. Um, one to look at the effects of, of social networks. So looking at what happens when um, someone in your network gets assigned um, to a certain type of school and someone who's similar to them barely uh, doesn't get assigned. How does that affect the outcomes of other people in the network? In this case, looking at siblings, older siblings and younger siblings focusing on older siblings who are right around the cutoff for getting admission to a given school and seeing whether narrowly getting assigned to a school um, 
changes the outcomes of a younger sibling compared to someone who was narrowly not assigned to a school that they also applied to. Uh, and then the third one is looking at uh, impacts of nudges. So basically looking at a discontinuity in um, the uh, a rule that's used to provide information to students about whether they should change a, a suggestion that they should consider other choices. And looking at students who narrowly uh, were at risk above the risk cutoff and got that information versus students who didn't, seeing whether that changes um, their application behavior and combining that with a randomized experiment. So all of these are illustrations of how we can use exogenous variation to pin down, uh, isolate what the effects are of information per se, as opposed to other factors that could be correlated with information. Um, let me stop there again for any questions. Uh, we don't have any further questions at this point. Okay, great. So I'll dive right in then to talking about these three. Oh, I see one just came in, I think. Yeah. How can, you how can you distinguish the causal effect of information change when your treated student's school preference align with the information provided by the intervention? Um, so if their preferences align with the, so you would um, hold preferences fixed, but basically saying um, if it's a randomized experiment, we have on average students in the treated group have the same preferences as students in the control group. Um, so information to students if the preferences align. Um, you can basically look at students with those preferences who get this information and you would be comparing them to students with similar preferences who don't get that information. And so there we basically are saying, um, you know, conditional on a given set of preferences, what is the impact of providing information? And if it reinforces your preferences or if it aligns with your preferences, then we see these impacts. But uh, in the counterfactual for people who don't get that information, depending on the, the goal of the research design is to hold um, everything else fixed. So to focus on similar students with similar preferences, either because it's a randomized experiment, so on average in a large population preferences should be fixed within the treated and control groups, or in a regression discontinuity design, looking at students who had the same preferences because they applied to the same choice, um, but had uh, a small difference in their test scores. So one scored just a, enough to gain admission to a school and one scored um, just below the cutoff. So they have the same preferences and very similar test scores, except for a few points. Um, and uh, that change in the admission outcomes of the older siblings changes the information that their younger siblings has, have, because their younger siblings then, um, presumably coming from similar environments because their older siblings had similar preferences, but now we'll have information from going to one school, from having a sibling who went to a certain type of school, and the other one won't have that information because their older sibling went to a different type of school. Um, so the goal of uh, this using exogenous variation is precisely that, is to hold preferences fixed and to say, how can we isolate the impact of information? The kind of nuanced thing is that information might change preferences, um, and the last paper I'll talk about kind of alludes to that is, is basically a setting in which um, through simulation they, they calculate that the impact of updating beliefs alone, information alone would be different, is, is less than what we find from a, a randomized experiment, because in the randomized experiment, um, providing information could change people's preferences. Uh, and so one way to capture the additional effect of changing preferences is to compare the effects you find in a randomized experiment and evaluation of the experiment to the effects you would get from structural estimation and simulation of the impacts of an experiment, holding only changes in uh, uh, beliefs and not allowing preferences to vary. Okay, so um, the first paper, I talked about earlier is um, yeah from the context of Ghana, uh, and here we're looking at the question three quick three main questions. First, what information do parents and students say that they want? Second, does receiving this information affect students' choices and educational outcomes? And third, does who receives this information matter? So, getting at this question about whether parents or students are the decision maker, and does providing information to parents or students um, vary the impacts of information provision. Uh, so our approach is to uh, use the randomized evaluation. So we randomly assign schools to uh, students in schools to receive uh, a combined intervention, which is an information booklet with information on all of the schools in the region. 
in the Ashanti region, we do the study. So all the, the secondary schools in the region um, listing what their historical selectivity has been and historical performance on the secondary school certification exam. To show a video and the snapshot I had at the beginning was from that video, which is basically a, a dramatization of the school selection process and uh, illustrating how one child um, used information to make their choices and, and got into a school that they liked and were happy with their admission outcome. Whereas another student uh, basically didn't take the time to inform himself and ended up um, you know, being dismissive of his choices and not getting into the school he liked and then being satisfied with the school that he got into. Um, basically highlighting the potential value of taking the time to um, inform oneself about the characteristics of schools and to understand the assignment process so that they can uh, maximize their admission chances and um, their, their potential welfare. And then combining that with the question and answer workshop in which students were invited to ask questions uh, and parents in the parent workshop. Uh, and so what we find is that students whose parents were directly targeted um, gain admission to higher value added schools and were more likely to comply with their school assignment. Um, uh, whereas for students, when we target students alone, we find changes in students' admission choices, or stu students' application choices, uh, but no changes in their final outcomes in terms of uh, where they get admitted and whether they um, attain, attend the school that they were assigned to. I'll go into more detail and in, into the conceptual framework and, and how we get to these results. Um, so the kind of um, theory of change is that um, students receive information. Um, so in, in improving the information available to students and their parents will increase the likelihood that they uh, use this information in their choices and that they list uh, four choices based on this information. Um, they'll then take the exam and they'll get admitted to one program, uh, which is a program that more aligns with their preferences because they're now able to make choices with, uh, with this information. And that they'd be more likely to matriculate into secondary school. So, actually transition from choices into going to secondary school and that they'll go to a school um, that they like better, uh, that's more aligned with their preferences because they made this informed a choice to begin with. Um, so there are multiple steps along this way and our goal is really to understand whether information does, whether this theory um, is validated by the process that we observe and whether improving information ultimately improves admission outcomes and matriculation outcomes um, by, uh, allowing students to really act on their choices. So the research design, we focused on 900 junior high schools in um, the biggest region in Ghana, Ashanti region. And we assigned schools into one of three groups. One group um, of 300 schools, information was given to students. In the second group, it was given to students in school and then their parents were invited to a separate information session where they received information directly. And in the third group, um, no additional information is provided. Uh, this was done in 2015, um, uh, focused on students in their final year of junior high school. And then in the following year, we collected data to track, follow them into their first year, what should have been their first year of senior high school. And we use administrative data on all the students from those 900 schools. So we um, got information on the choices that they submitted, the um, performance of the exam, where they got assigned. And then we use survey data to collect additional information on a subset of these students. Um, so doing a, a sample of, of students from a random sample of students from each of these schools. Uh, we collected information based on their beliefs and their preferences. Um, and then later on, on whether there were changes in their beliefs and preferences. And then on the collected information from their guardians to get also information on their beliefs and preferences. And um, ultimately to look at where students ended up going to school because we don't have that in the administrative data. Uh, so what we find is that um, students saw the booklet. So in these regressions, we're basically looking at uh, the coefficients on an indicator for being in a school where students received information, an indicator for being in a school where parents additionally received information. Um, and 80% uh, of students said they had seen any booklet um, with information on schools, uh, but this increased um, in both the treatment arms where students received information. 
Um, so there were some other booklets that were around that provided just the names of schools, but not the information on selectivity and performance. So students may have seen those books that may be what they're referring to. But we find that students are um, more likely to see a booklet, and then they're much more likely to report that they, they see a, they watch the video. So only 14% of students in the control group said they watched the video, um, but we have a 78 percentage point increase uh, for students in the treatment groups. And then there's no change in whether students say they believe the process, the school choice system is fair or not. About half of students say they believe that it's fair. Um, so information changed people's perception of the system. Uh, they, the students received the information, but it didn't change their perceptions of the system. Uh, information shifted towards the booklet and away from other resources. So we asked students, uh, what was the main source of information used for making choices? Um, students are more likely to say that they used a booklet to make their choices, less likely to say they used radio, TV, newspaper, uh, the internet, uh, or just relied on other people's or some other source. So they're more likely to um, shift their information used to, to what we targeted. Um, we also, and I didn't include it here for the interest of time, but we also find that parents are more likely, students and parents say that their parents are more likely to get involved. Um, and students tend to say that they're more like focused on the fact, the, using the, they're more, they care more about the factors that were included in the booklet, which is the location of the schools and um, the school selectivity. Are there any other questions? I'll stop at this point. Uh, one more question for now. Could you specify whether the randomization took place at the school or student level in case it took place yeah. at the, sorry, in case it no, took place at the individual yeah. level where you're able to rule out or control the spillover effects through student sharing booklets? Yeah, so it took place at the school level. So we had, um, yeah, 300 schools where information was given to students and then 300 schools where we invited parents. And we did that precisely for this, um, the risk of spillover. So we focused on um, yeah, we imagine that at, this, at the individual level, schools, students would share booklets. Um, and so, yeah, it was a school level treatment. Okay, so students were more likely to apply to schools in Ashanti region. So we only focused on providing information on schools in Ashanti region because of the number of schools we wanted to, uh, most we wanted to tailor the information to um, the, the schools that were most where most students applied. So 90% of students applied to Ashanti region and students were uh, four percentage points more likely to apply to schools in Ashanti region when they received the, the information booklet. They selected schools with um, slightly uh, lower admission standards, so less selective schools, but with equivalent secondary school admission scores, which means that the value added of these schools um, uh, or, or performance of these schools stayed the same. Um, we don't find any increases in the likelihood that they um, uh, diversify their, the list of schools that they apply to, or that they rank schools in order of selectivity. So we don't see any evidence they're improving their information strategies. Um, but when we look at the uh, impacts on admission character, we don't see any impacts on the likelihood they get admitted to any school or that they get admitted to their first choice schools. But we do see for the parent information arm an increases in students um, being admitted to schools in Ashanti region and an increase in students admitted to schools with higher value added. Um, which suggests that they're using this information to um, kind of optimize which schools that they're applying to, particularly in the case where um, parents are informed directly. Um, but then when we get to the final question, the final step in this causal chain is whether students are matriculating at schools with um, better observed, whether they're more likely to uh, uh, attend the school that they got assigned to. Um, we don't see any significant impacts. So 60% of students, um, and when we go back to survey them in the, where they should be in their first year of secondary school, 60% of students in the control group are attending school. Uh, we don't see a significant difference in um, the treatment groups. So it's not the case that students who receive more information are more likely to be happy with their assignment and more likely to go to school. What we find instead is that the main reason students don't, um, the 40% of students who aren't attending school, the main reason they say they're not attending for 75% of students is the cost. So information does not seem to be a constraint, um, a key constraint in terms of attending school. Neither is it 
uh, a key factor in determining whether students started on time. So 44% of students started school on time uh, and 23% of those who were overall, 23% of students in the sample are attending the school they were admitted to. So conditional on um, uh, attending school, 40% of students in the treatment group are attending the school that they were assigned to. And we do see that the parent information arm increases the likelihood that students are attending the school that they were assigned to. Um, uh, and attending a school with a higher uh, secondary school performance. Uh, so overall, this suggests that providing information to parents directly has um, uh, s s more impacts than uh, by providing parents to students individually. We suggest that parents are the key decision maker in a lot of contexts uh, and that students don't communicate um, perfectly with parents. There isn't a perfect transi transition of information. Um, but at the same time, we don't see the fact that we don't see big increases in the likelihood of uh, starting school on time or attending the, your school overall suggests that information isn't the key constraint in terms of preventing students from um, uh, going, improving match quality and increasing the likelihood that students comply with a school assignment. Um, it suggests that other factors such as cost, for example, um, and um, potentially salience of decision making at the time that students apply to school are really driving part of this, the fact that a lot of students aren't applying to, aren't complying with their school assignments in this context. I think there was another question that came up. Uh, yeah, there was a question about if there's any difference based on gender. Yeah, so in the paper, we look at heterogeneity by gender. We don't find significant differences based on gender. We also look based on high ability and low ability, and we don't see um, significant heterogeneity there. Um, so the main, um, yeah, the overall results are pretty similar across uh, different types of students, also based on parents' education. Uh, we don't, in this case, see a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, but the key thing we do see is that uh, yeah, targeting parents directly, which is more costly, um, does have some um, marginal improvement on uh, the likelihood that students apply, but uh, attend better schools and comply with their uh, assignments. Um, but again, this is a context in which this is a, someone asked a question of outside options and people paying bribes. So this is a context in which there's a high, relatively high rate of non-compliance. Um, so overall, 40% of students are not going to the school that they have got assigned to. Um, and so in this case, um, yeah, the, the, the potential if effects of information could be different in a case where there is higher levels of compliance with this and fewer outside options. Were there a couple more questions? Uh, yeah, also along those lines of gender, there was a question if there's any difference in the study between mothers and fathers. Um, yeah, we didn't vary that, so we don't, I think we have information on whether the mother or the father was a key decision maker, but we don't, we didn't experimentally vary that, so we can't say whether informing mothers or fathers has a differential effect. Um, yeah, because we basically invited, told students to invite their parents, but we didn't tell them, yeah, we didn't experimentally vary that. All right, so I'll move on to the next paper. So the main takeaway of that is that targeting matters and that there are, as someone mentioned earlier, there are different decision makers sometimes. And so it, it could be important to think about who is the main decision maker. I'll move on to a second paper using the regression discontinuity design, which looks at how family networks affect school choice. Um, this paper takes place in the context of Mexico City and the public high school choice system there where students are assigned uh, similarly to Ghana based on their listed preferences and a standardized exam score. Um, and the approach here is to use a regression discontinuity design, comparing older siblings and mission outcomes, and looking at the effects of older siblings and mission outcomes on younger siblings' choices and their admission outcomes. And the key result is that um, the assignment of older siblings strongly affects the choices that younger siblings list and where they get assigned which um, suggests that social networks, in this case, family networks matter as potentially a, a one channel for getting information in the school choice process. I've seen, if, I think a few more questions come up. I'll, let me take some time to address those before we go into this. Uh, one question, uh, are the treated schools and control schools far away from one another? 
Um, some of them are, so we stratified by um, district within the region. And so within each region, we have schools in each of the three treatment arms. And um, we look at spillovers and that it doesn't seem to be, uh, because we do find differences in the first stage. So we find significant differences in the likelihood that students report seeing the booklet and seeing the videos, which suggests that um, there weren't, uh, the spillovers weren't that high. So if we, if, if everybody was seeing the video and, and seeing the information, or if everybody changed, reported changing their, their source of information, then we would be concerned that this is um, you know, being driven by spillovers. But the fact that we see um, differences in um, the likelihood that people saw the booklets and differences in what they say were the most important factors that made, uh, that influence their choices suggests that it's not the limited outcomes we see, impacts we see in um, ultimate outcomes isn't being driven by the fact that people um, got information secondhand. Okay, so moving on to this, uh, coming back to this uh, question, this study in the context of Mexico City. So here again, the foundation of the study is administrative data compiled by um, the uh, agency that's focused on, on administering the centralized school system, uh, COMIPEMS. So for each student uh, who registered for, for the exam over a 14 year period, um, you know, that has information on the, the basic demographics, um, a short context survey that asks about parental education and family composition, and then their list of up to 20 ranked preferences and their assignment results. And um, linking students based on, uh, students are linked based on their names and, and uh, focus on sibling pairs. The samples restricted to sibling pairs where the older sibling attended a public middle school and the younger sibling took an exam at the end of middle school. So it's basically looking across the 14 year cycles of uh, any uh, siblings where they, they had at least one older sibling who attended a public middle school. And the strategy is um, quite simple. It's basically comparing older siblings, uh, starting off with the identification from older siblings who have um, uh, similar uh, test scores and focusing on what this graph shows the students for uh, kind of pooling um, different uh, cutoffs for different um, schools, focusing on the right on students who scored above the cutoff for admission. These are older siblings who scored above cutoff for admission to a given school and students who scored below the cutoff. And you see on the left side, none of the students who score below the cutoff are admitted to this more selective school, but on the right side, we see a significant increase in the likelihood that students gain admission to this school. Uh, and so this provides exogenous variation in terms of for the younger siblings, it's um, variation in, in their, um, the experience of their older sibling. So for students on the right, the older sibling is much more likely to attend this more selective school. And for students on the left, uh, their older sibling was less likely to attend um, this selective school. And so then using this similar strategy, you can look at younger siblings' choices. Um, so, Students on the right-hand side are those who, whose sibling scored above the cutoff. There is a significant increase, uh, about a five uh, percentage point increase in the likelihood that they list that school that their sibling got into as their first choice. And then there is um, an increase also in the likelihood that they list that school as any one of their choices. Uh, Whereas for students who are below the cutoff, they, there's a decrease in the likelihood that they list the school that their student now that their sibling narrowly missed getting into. So in panel C, this is basically looking at the school that their sibling would have gotten placed into if they had gone into that more selective choice. And students on the right hand side are less likely to list that. But students whose um, older sibling got into that lower ranked choice are much more likely to list that lower ranked choice as their first choice or as any one of their choices. Um, so this basically provides um, suggestive evidence that having a sibling who goes to, gets in, narrowly gets into a higher, more selective school, changes the school students at the, young, the schools that the younger sibling applies to. Um, and it, this translates also into where they get assigned. So having a sibling who scored above the cutoff for admission to a school increases the likelihood that the younger sibling is assigned to that cutoff school. Um, decreases the likelihood by comparison that they're assigned to the less selective school. 
Uh, and this goes beyond just the specific school, but also um, increases the likelihood of getting assigned to schools in the same subsystem. So in, in, the, in the Mexico City system, there are different subsystems of schools. Uh, and um, so it's basically saying that getting assigned, having a sibling who is assigned to a certain type of school, it increases the likelihood that you yourself or the younger sibling is assigned to that similar type of school. So it's not, um, this suggests that it's not a, a, a function of you wanting to be close to your sibling, but more about this information that you're learning something about this type of school uh, and um, your likelihood of, of excelling there or, or liking that school, or even your awareness that this is an option of, of where you could go. Um, so the main conclusions from this study is that family networks um, do seem to be an important source of information. Uh, older siblings' experiences affect younger siblings' choices and assignment. Um, in the paper, um, the author does some additional work to demonstrate that it rule out the possibility that this is these effects are being driven through um, channels specific to siblings, such as convenience, commuting, or sibling rivalry, um, but suggests that it is highlighting a broader role of peer networks and something that would likely translate or potentially translate to other social networks, such as older friends, classmates, other family members, um, as a potential source of information. And the, broadly, the policy implication is that information sharing uh, and kind of being tied to one path due to the perceived difficulty of, of getting into the, uh, through the school choice process could affect students' choice. Uh, and, and by that, by extension, then in providing information, not just through um, older siblings' experiences and social networks, but potentially through, um, you know, having an information campaign where you tell students, uh, by illustrating someone similar to them that there are different schools that they could go to that could also potentially have positive impacts on students' experiences. The last paper um, I'll talk about in terms of uh, highlighting the potential role of exogenous variation is um, this paper which looks at the role of search costs and how that, what role that potentially plays in affecting school choice. Um, so the key question is, is how, do search costs affect, how do search costs affect school choice and can information intervention expand search by reducing these search costs or incentivizing people to continue searching uh, and improve their admission outcomes? The context of this study is in Chile and um, the, uh, in the study looks at um, the effects of introducing a, a smart or, or increase in, including a warning system on this um, matching platform that's used for assignment. And here they use two identification strategies. One is a regression discontinuity assign, a, a design where they predict students likelihood of getting um, unplaced. So uh, in the Chile cases, uh, in Ghana and some other contexts, if students don't get assigned, uh, if there's a limited number of schools that students can get assigned to, if, if they don't, the students can list, if they don't get assigned to one of their choices then they're unassigned and non-placed. Uh, and so using historical data, you can predict based on students' um, characteristics, what's the likelihood um, for a given set of choices that they won't be assigned to one of their choices. And so what the study does is for students who have a higher than 30% risk of not being placed, uh, they receive a warning message uh, in the system that um, tells them that given your choices, there's a high chance you're not gonna be assigned to a school. Um, it would suggest that you pick a different choice or expand your number of choices. In addition to this, they randomly assigned whether students receive text messages as another nudge encouraging them to go back to the system and, and expand their choices. Um, and what they find is that receiving a warning, so using the regression discontinuity, students who are above the likely, who had a higher placement risk, 20% um, of students who received this warning um, added schools to their applications, so expanded their choice set, so took more time to expand their search. And this reduced the likelihood that they were unplaced and increased the likelihood that they enrolled in higher quality schools. By comparison, they find that just sending a uh, um, text message saying you should consider expanding your choice set without providing the risk information, so without saying there's a risk you might not be assigned, doesn't have any effects. Um, so this suggests the importance of personalizing information and highlighting the risk of, of non-assignment as a reason for um, expanding search. Um, that, that is potentially more, in this case, more valuable than generically giving students information that, or the guidance that they should apply to more schools. Um, here, survey data is relevant and, and valuable, and they um, 
conduct a survey to ask about why students aren't adding more schools. So why do students stop searching for schools? They find that 35% of students say that they think they will be placed as the main reason that they um, don't provide more schools. Um, so this is a common theme in this case and in other contexts where students are typically overconfident about their admission chances. And this overconfidence, which is um, one aspect of lack of information or bias in beliefs, um, in fact, impacts their search behavior and their, their selection of, of schools. Um, so what they find is that when they tell students to um, apply to more schools, um, there's a significant increase in the likelihood that students who are above the threshold and are, are, are given this nudge or this warning, um, there's a 20% increase in the likelihood that they apply to at least another school. Um, and um, an increase in the, the number of schools added. There's a significant decrease in the like in their risk of um, being unassigned. So they're applying to additional school, which is one that where they have a higher admission chance. Um, and but there's no uh, significant decrease in the or change in the likelihood that they get enrolled, um, that they enroll in their in their place school conditional on being placed. So what this means is it's not that like students are applying to another additional school that they don't want to go to. Ultimately, they um, are. Uh, equally as likely to enroll in the school that they, they get assigned to. Uh, in terms of the characteristics of schools, students are applying to schools with higher value added, uh, applied to schools with higher teacher pay, which could be a proxy for um, uh, school quality, um, and where there's a copayment fee, another dimension of, of school quality, uh, and schools that have higher enrollment per grade. Uh, so overall, this paper suggests that search costs are very, um, the students are overly optimistic about their admission chances, and this optimism leads them to search too little, so to stop searching too early because they're overconfident that they uh, have already sufficiently included enough schools to gain admission. Um, providing personalized support um, could reduce search costs and be helpful, but strategies proof mechanisms um, going to the point earlier about mechanism design, even in mechanisms like this one in Chile where students have um, uh, free list, free cho ask, um, choice, and they can list as many choices as they want to, there still are constraints that are linked to information which arise from this fact that search is costly. The last thing I'll talk about is structural estimation. So um, with randomized experiments, we can identify the causal effect of a specific intervention, uh, but sometimes it's valuable to go beyond that and to say what would hypothetically be the impacts of changing a different feature um, in the um, school context or providing information to everybody beyond who we can, the, the, the group that we can afford to treat. Uh, and so structural estimation, which is basically a process where we identify key parameters in the, um, a model of school choice, and then vary these parameters, allow us to simulate the policy effects of, uh, simulate the effects of different policies and to um, allow for heterogeneous treatment effects. So look at whether the effects of changing these, these factors are different for different types of people. The key limitation is it requires on the, uh, it relies modeling assumptions. So we have to make key assumptions about how people would behave under different scenarios. Um, and um, that's what kind of links, that's the foundation for uh, this, um, these simulation and analysis. So the value or validity of these exercises really depends on um, how uh, realistic or credible the assumptions in the models are. An example of this paper, of a paper that does this, is um, this uh, paper that looks at the effects of providing information on value added in Romania. Um, so this paper combines a randomized experiment in which certain schools, students in certain schools are given information on value added for different schools. Um, and it combines that with a structural estimation to basically simulate what would be the effects of giving everybody, updating everybody's beliefs to be accurate about the value added in different schools. And what they find is that um, beliefs account for 15% of the value added at households um, with low achieving ch children leave ex at exploited and accounts for a lower percent uh, for students with um, high achieving students. Um, and a starting point is basically finding that households could select schools with one standard deviation worth of additional value added. So finding that school students don't apply or households don't select the schools with highest value added. Uh, and a key question is why. It could be that they value other things. They put more 
um, importance on other things apart from value added, or that they have incorrect beliefs about schools value added. Uh, what this paper finds is that randomly that this information is part of the problem, is part of the explanation. So randomly providing information on value added does change um, students' accuracy of beliefs and um, changes, increases the likelihood that lower achieving students apply to higher value added schools, but doesn't completely get them to apply to the most high value added schools available, which indicates that there are other factors other than information and other than value added that are important in the school choice process. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is qualitative data and the extent to which qualitative data can complement the other components I've talked about earlier. As economists, we tend to focus on um, you know, administrative data, quantitative data, survey data, um, but a lot of the time there are still gaps that we can get more light on or more information on by doing in-depth interviews, focus group discussions to really probe further in terms of understanding um, how are people making decisions in different contexts? Um, and in cases where we do information interventions, understanding how did people um, respond to uh, the information provided? Why did they or did they not respond in the ways that were anticipated? And also to validate modeling assumptions. Are people behaving in the way that we assume in models that they're actually behaving? Um, so some final thoughts on information and centralized school assignment. Um, so overall, centralized school assignment offers a unique policy instrument because it is a context in which people are making decisions at a large scale um, on a regular basis. And simple changes in the mechanism design or the information it provided could have um, kind of wide reaching systemic wide uh, impacts. And it also provides a unique learning opportunity because there is information from administrative data on the universe of students in, in these contexts. Um, but at the same time, it's important to blend multiple data sources and empirical strategies in order to um, gain the maximum amount of insights in this context. We, learn, we can learn some things from administrative data, but there are clear limitations. Uh, and overall, while information is uh, undoubtedly important in terms of informing and in terms of uh, determining people's choices, there are uh, evidence demonstrates that there are many other factors that determine school choice. So parents and students place value on um, different things such as the cost of schools and um, other factors of schools. So even when they have full information about value added of schools, their admission chances, they may still make uh, choices that are perceived that are not maximizing um, their expected value of, uh, in terms of, of the academic performance of schools they choose because they are um, valuing other aspects of schools. And the last thing to keep in mind is that potentially heterogeneous impacts of information provision and potentially multiple actors in the decision-making process. Uh, so information may be beneficial for, and typical studies typically find it's more beneficial for low achieving students uh, and that it might be important to target multiple decision-makers. Um, I think I'll stop there if there's any last questions. Yeah, I'll take a couple. Um, we have one question. Do we have some insights on why information might not be a constraint? Do parents slash students have access to other sources of information about selectivity and value added? Um, so the reason it might not be a constraint is that even under full information, so the, the, the kind of benchmark is in the, in the um, in the paper with a value added, the benchmark is saying, um, you know, if students, if schools and students were maximizing value added, so if students and households were trying to apply to the school with the highest value added, what choices would they make? And um, what we see in that context is that students aren't applying to the school with the highest value added. And so part of the reason they're not applying is because they have biased beliefs. So what they, they perceive to be the value added of schools is, is not correct. But even when you correct those beliefs, even when students have full information about the value added of different schools, they might be applied to a school that's, or prefer a school that's closer to them with lower value added because um, distance is an important factor. And so the reason why information might not be, um, and the key constraint is that households are maximizing multiple factors. There are different things that go in to choices and it's not just a question of um, how much, how well does the school perform? but also things like um, 
you know, how, how far away is the school? How expensive is the school? What's the peer group and um, different things like that. Okay, another question. Um, how can you accurately measure the role of students' preferences or information in scenarios where there's local corruption or politically motivated decisions about where children are assigned? Yeah, so a key assumption in this, and, and that's one, and I think another thing that uh, and the administrative data can be helpful in, is testing or understanding how uh, assignment takes place and whether it actually is following the mechanism that is, um, has been laid out. Uh, so in cases where there is supposed to be a rule that assigns students to schools and a clear priority, then it's clear to see that. In some cases, there are a certain subset of, of, of choices that are restricted for um, protocol or you know, other mechanisms for assignment, other preference, preferences or priorities, sorry, other priorities, not preferences. So in those cases, uh, it's not, um, you can have some information about for people who don't have those priorities, what are the, what's the role of information and preferences for them, but for people who are outside of that system, it is, uh, more challenging to understand what their um, decision-making process is because they do have that outside option. Uh, so it really depends on the context, the extent to which we can uh, really identify the importance of uh, preferences and information separate from corruption or some other priority um, depends on the context and, and what the assignment mechanism is. I think unfortunately that might be all the time you have for questions. All right, well, thank you everybody. Um, and uh, I hope you go on and do interesting work on centralized school assignment and information.